And the discussion this evening, because this is spring Ohegon period, and we're going to be focusing on Sheila, which is morality. And why don't you just leave that up, put up the uh, And so you say, putting it on so I can see everyone. <clears throat> and um, Ohegon occurs twice a year. It's centered on the equinox and then for the week around the equinox, which means that there's one in the spring and one in the fall. And that also means that I end up doing this twice a year. And last year, we went back to Ohegon practices in Japan and how the Japanese culture and Buddhism are really part of a cultural, I, mean, I should say that, that Ohegon practices in Japan tie Japanese culture and Buddhism into a single observance. And this is important. And in Japan, Buddhism is not so much a religion as much as it's a part of a culture. As it is offset in Japan, one is born Buddhist. Outside of Asia, one becomes Buddhist. And I think that there's a lot of, of truth to that. But this year, I wanted to look, I'm not going to, to do those Japanese practices or even how we practice it outside of Japan. It's traditional to look at Ohigan in relation to the six paramitas or the six perfections. And rather than doing all the six perfections this evening, I'm going to concentrate on one, which specifically is Shila, which is morality. And you'll see on the handout, uh, a basic of Buddhist teaching is the Eightfold Path, which includes Shila, morality, but it also includes within the six Old path. Sheila includes morality, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And along with dhyana, which is right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, and of course prajna, which is right views and right thought. Sheila is therefore fundamental to the Buddhist path. It's also the second of the six paramitas. The Noble Eightfold Truth is the last of the four noble truths. The path that leads from samsara to nirvana. The Eightfold Path is not a linear one in that one passes from one step to the next, but it's a cumulative program. All the steps are practiced simultaneously. The six paramitas, or perfections by contrast, is a course of spiritual development practiced by a bodhisattva. And these are linear and they are ranked from easiest to attain to the most difficult. The first three within the six perfections are Dana, generosity, Shila, morality, and Kashante, patience. They are originally intended to be expected to be done by everyone, both lay and ordained practitioners. Um, they are, as I said, the easiest to, to accomplish. Compared to the final three, virya, which is translated as courage or forbearance, as well as samadhi, which is meditation and prajna, intuitive insight. And those final three, uh, virya, prajna, and, or samadhi and prajna, anyone can do them, but it's expected that one has to spend more intensive practice to really accomplish them. However, even with the six perfections, they could all be practiced simultaneously, and there, but there is an order to them. And no matter how you look at it, both in the six perfections as well as the Eightfold Noble Truth, Sheila is pivotal. The earliest references to a moral code of conduct were the five precepts taken by lay people and the 10 precepts vowed by renunciants. And during the years of Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching, the Sangha did not need the Vinaya, which is the uh, rules and procedures that govern the Buddhist monastic community. The early disciples lived in harmony, or so we are told, with only the ten precepts. The complete Vinaya Pitaka, Pitaka was 
instituted during the first council shortly after Shakyamuni Buddha's death. So the earliest of the so-called moral codes, which were the um, Dasa Shila, the 10 precepts, were in place during Shakyamuni Buddha's lifetime in the Vinaya, the longer code of discipline, 250, approximately 250 for men and 320 for women were instituted um, shortly after Shakyamuni Buddha's death. So the 10 precepts require abstention from taking life, taking what is not given, committing sexual misconduct, <coughs> abstention from engaging in false speech, using intoxicants, eating after midday, <coughs> participation in worldly amusements, or adorning the body with ornaments and using perfume, um, sleeping on high and luxurious beds, <laughs> and accepting gold and silver. The laity observed the first five precepts referred to as the Pansasila. By the way, for all of you who are ordained, if you're sleeping on a high and luxurious bed, you're in big trouble. Just keep that in mind. How about using the aftershave lotion? And to say nothing of aftershave <laughs> below it, you know. But what's a so high and luxurious bed? What you sleep on. <laughs> Unless you sleep on a pair of rope bed on or, the floor. or just on the floor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so one can see how the final five of the precepts may be restricted to monastics. Yeah. And you will note that the 10 major precepts of the Bodhisattva vows from the Brahmajala Sutra uh, change the final five. And this is a distinction between Shravaka Yana and Bodhisattva Yana paths. So the first 10 that were practiced at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha and are still part of the um, uh, Theravadan tradition um, are the final five are changed within the Mahayana. And actually, within the vows that we take in Tendai, the last six are changed. Number six is of the, of the major precepts it, that are followed by Tendai is, no, excuse me, number five is not to deal in intoxicants. We're not even talking about not imbibing, but not dealing in intoxicants, um, followed by not finding fault with others. Number seven is boasting about oneself in front of others. Number eight is begrudging requests for help and ignore the pleas of others in need. And this one is a very important one on the Bodhisattva path. And number nine, becoming angry and despising others. And number 10, Dishonoring the three treasures, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Hold on a second while I get a sip. No. <laughs> no despising. <laughs> the precepts are commandments, directions, or guidance given as a rule of action. And this is the org origin of Buddhist morality in terms of its codification. But Shila as morality is a practice necessary for awakening as virtuous conduct and thought. And Dale Wright writes, these precepts are considered paths of training because they function not just to prohibit immoral behavior, but also more importantly, to transform the character of the practitioner. In fact, in all forms of Buddhism, morality is perfected when an enlightened motivation takes hold, a motivation in which moral rules are no longer the focus of, of attention. So I want to point, make a, a point here that when we look at the precepts, whether it's five precepts, ten precepts, or we look at the Vinaya which is often stipulated in don't do this or don't do that. We think of it in terms of the negative aspect, but in a moral context, it's not so much a negative aspect as the positive aspect, such as the one that you should work to uh, relieve the suffering of those in need, as an example. And 
from a bodhisattva perspective, the moral action is not just about one's own purity, but also the development of human society as a whole in its movement toward awakening. And remember, if one is on the bodhisattva path, one takes a bodhisattva vow. Sentient beings are memberless. I vow to save them. And then through the other, the other three. So in that context, the bodhisattva is implored to work for something, towards something, not necessarily against something. And I think that that's a really big distinction that we should make at this time. That doesn't mean that one should not should be excuse me. That doesn't mean that one should be judgmental regarding others. Only that one's own actions are a guide and a model for others' actions. Also, it's difficult if the person and their loved ones are hungry and without shelter to act morally. In other words, one of the things that we know in the Buddhist teachings is that in order to even follow the teachings. One needs to have sustenance, shelter, clothing, etc. One needs to be cared for at some level. If one is not cared for, then it's expected that a person will not necessarily be able to follow the Buddhist path. And furthermore, it's recognized that what we as individuals see as immorality in others may not be due to their inherent character, but it may be due to the fact that they don't have the wherewithal to act in what we would consider a moral action. In other words, it's, it's a conundrum that, that we study in our first year philosophy classes. Um, if a, when we have an individual whose child is starving and the individual steals a loaf of bread, is that theft? We recognize it that it's theft, but is it necessarily justified if it's going to save the child's life, as an example? Those are the things that philosophy students get involved in, in terms of, of discussions. So in this, in this case, morality is not about the prohibitions or immoral acts. What you cannot do is about how to be virtuous, what you are obligated to do. Further. Morality is seen as engaging in the world to right wrongs, make a more just society, consider the lives of others as dear to you as a mother considers her only child to be dear to her. And we could extend that to the earth itself. If we're not acting in a way which is consistent with the, what benefits the earth, the environment, then that would be an immoral action. There's a strong connection between shila and karma. Karma is action by definition. One takes morality, excuse me, karma is the action that one takes. Morality has the same root. Thus, the purpose of repentance as enacted through the daily recitation of the Sangemon is a way to evaluate whether one's actions have been virtuous or impure paying attention to the moral karmic dimensions of the situation in which we find ourselves requires that we are mindful of the nuances of daily actions. Specifically, are we considerate of the environment when we act in a way that disregards the environmental consequences of an action? When we and, and here I'm using the term mindful because this really is part of what is considered mindfulness, is what I just described. You have heard me say engaged Buddhism is really a misnomer. I, I, I understand the term engaged Buddhism, but I find it to be to have arisen out of a notion that somehow Buddhism is not engaged. Whereas my understanding of Buddhism from the time that I first started studying it was that Buddhism means that you are engaged all the time. That's the very no nature of Buddhism. It's inherent in the bodhisattva vows, which is a moral code. To avoid begrudging requests for help and ignore the pleas of others in need, this addresses racism, environmental catastrophe, sexism, etc. 
when exploring the three specific moral references in the Eightfold Path, right speech, right action, and right livelihood, morality or purity is attained through all of our actions, not just a select few. We can't, we don't have a choice to pick and choose. This includes all our actions toward ensuring that there is economic and social equity for all people. Are we cognizant of how we speak, speaking of right speech? Are we cognizant of how we speak, speak to a person at the convenience store? Do we look at that person and say, well, this is just a convenience store clerk. I can be rude to them. It doesn't really make a difference. You know, it, look how you speak to, let's say, the clerk at the convenience store versus a, a teacher or a police person. You know, I think that would that would, might make a difference. <clears throat> Do we treat that person with respect and patience, speaking of the person at the convenience store? Or are we so self-centered that we do not look past our own immediate needs? Hey, I'm busy here. Let's go. Come on. Stop playing lotto. Give me my, give me my uh, change for my milk or whatever it happens to be. Do we act to stand up for the rights of people when the rights to equity is in question, such as the criminal justice reform? Do we participate in injustices by our complacency? Or do we actively work to change system, systemic imbalances? That is a moral issue. It's not political, it's social, but it is certainly moral. How is your money invested? If you're fortunate enough to have investments, that is livelihood. Livelihood includes any way that a person receives recompense. There are better and worse jobs. I've had both. Most of us have. But there are also jobs which contribute to the welfare of others, contrasted with those jobs that exploit or are heedless of the needs and the rights of others. Most jobs are neutral. They're, not, they're neither moral nor immoral in their very nature. It's often how one pursues one's job that makes a difference. I remember a number of years ago, somebody asked me, can you be a, car, a used car salesman as right livelihood? And my response was, you can be, but also it means that you might not sell as many cars because it means that you can't lie. Uh, I, what, what's lying to a used car salesman? You know, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, Sheila, morality is not merely prohibitions that are necessary for positive social interaction. And they are virtuous acts that are integral to the Bodhisattva path. And here I'm quoting right again. Those who are profoundly cultivated in the, in the discipline of morality will feel some degree of obligation to reach out to hungry beings wherever they are found on the planet. Beyond the sense of obligation, however, stands the personification of an ideal, the bodhisattva, who responds to the needs of strangers, not out of a sense of moral obligation, but out of a far deeper sense of identity with all living beings. And I think that really gets to the, to the heart of it, is that morality is not us versus them somehow. It's recognizing an identity with other living beings as a whole and acting for each of the living beings' benefit, not just for one's own benefit. So I'll, I, will, I could go on for a while on this, but I'll stop there. Why don't you reduce that and go to the next slide? And I will ask for questions comments, and thoughts. Now, I have to say, can, reduce that for a second so people are, can see. I have to say that when I looked at this bear, I thought to myself, I could have had a little kitty looking at us or a dog with those deep dog eyes or something along those lines. And I just wanted to point out that the bear is really interesting because it's got such small eyes compared to its head, whereas one of the reasons that we like dogs and cats is because of neoteny. They look like, like babies. 
and they make us smile. And so we don't feel as kindly disposed to the bear as we might to a kitten because they don't have that sense of neoteny. Anyway, so we will unmute everyone. Now you can. And ask if there's any questions. But nice to see you, Chip. <laughs> Uh, Joe, did you have your hand up? Oh, Joe. Joe, did you have your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm not sure if this is something that you intend to talk, uh, mention during the, your Dharma talk today, but uh, it wasn't clear so much the relationship between Sheila and Ohigan. So, uh, and I, I can understand, why right, Ohigan means the other shore. And I can understand what you mentioned today in, in two ways. One is working on Sheila so that we can do kind of an echo, a, a shujo echo, um, mm -hmm. echo for all sentient beings, including those who are on the other side or help people to be on the other side or that help ourselves alternatively to be on the other side. And also it reminds, what you spoke today reminded me of, right, one of the vows, shujo muhen segan do, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them, but save actually means to transfer and move them to the other shore. So right. I, I just wanted to understand in what sense you tie Shila and Ohigan. Thank you for the question, because obviously that I wasn't clear. It's a practice during Ohigan to examine the six perfections. That's, that's where it becomes. So rather than dealing with all the six perfections today, I was just going to take one. In a previous uh, Ohigan, because we do it twice a year, I had done um, Shamata. In another one, I may have done Prajna, et cetera. So rather than looking, I, there's the connection is that during Ohigan one, it makes the six perfections as the a centerpiece of one's practices. And so rather than doing all of them, although I will talk about them in the Dharma talk a little bit, today I just wanted to deal with one in more depth than, than six of them in, very in a very shallow manner. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Ralph, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, in the uh, 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 in your discussion, you talked about the Sangiman. The Sangiman should be done every day? It's, it's part of the daily service. Okay, is there other stuff within the, the service here that we should do every day? The daily service we do every day. <laughs> okay, the whole the whole daily service, all right. Because I just I, I meditate every day, but I don't go ahead and do all of the uh, the. Uh, <clears throat> one one of the things to think about is before your meditation. I mean, if you were to read the daily service, it really only takes what if you're five to ten minutes. Yeah. You know? Um, it, it probably the longest part of it is reciting the Heart Sutra. So if you were to do the whole daily service, it's five or ten minutes, and that becomes like a preamble or a conditioning to your meditation. So it can be useful to do the daily service as, as a, um, a way to lead into the meditation. Okay? Yep, understood. Okay, good. What about here? Are there any questions in the room, so to speak? Yeah, well, in summary, uh, do not do evil, do everything that is good, purify the mind. This is the teachings of all the Buddhas. So I take do no evil to me, no harm. Right. Which is, but uh, which yeah, really covers a lot of Sheila. It does. Uh, but it's, uh, but I think when we look at the, when we look specifically the way we're looking at it just now, it gives you more direction. That's all. You know, do no evil is where, where do you draw a line? You know, what's evil, what's not evil? You know, uh, you know, clearly wearing aftershave. No. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in a monastery, <laughs> I always thought, you know, when I when I thought about that, I thought, 
that's probably pretty good advice today because everybody's going to get upset. Why are you? I'm, I'm allergic to that. Why are you wearing that right. stuff? You know? <laughs> any any um, questions or comments or thoughts? Wearing deodorant must be evil too. <laughs> Yeah, that's a real problem. Well, it, I, I, what's what's that 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 um, deodorant that adolescent guys <coughs> like? It's called Axe. Axe. Yeah, that's that's the one to avoid. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm wondering if there's the same type of um, morality debates. Uh, I, I think of like mitzvot and and how in Judaism there's a lot of differentiating of this situation versus that situation. Or, or is that kind of left to the perpetual shade of gray that is inevitable within any given situation? Because we can't necessarily know the degree to which any given karmic action is well either, you know, positive or negative. Or karmic, you're talking no, specifically. No, actions, <laughs> actions, right. <laughs> yeah. Karmic. Yeah. Uh, the Dharmic traditions would look at it from a karmic perspective. But I think all religious traditions, they're notions of, of morality and expand that to ethics are rel relatively well spelled out. I don't, I don't think there's, I mean, the mitzvot are examples of, that include um, morality, mm -hmm. but such things, when you think about it from the Jewish code, for, for instance, such things as a farmer should leave their field fallow every seventh year and allow people to take from it freely would be an example of a moral injunction within Judaism. Um, and, and the idea of, of assisting, assisting those in need is, is a moral injunction also. So I think, I think it's inherent in all religious traditions. Any other questions? No other questions? Well, oh, I'm just going to comment in the daily service. We begin with a repentance. Right. Okay. And the repentance is about all the things we've done wrong. Well, and it, and it says specifically. And usually it's, the, it's a, in the realm of morality. Well, it's saying, well, I, I think that the, one of the points I was trying to make is that there is, that from a Buddhist perspective, the Shila are really tied intricately to, to karma. And the Sangemon says, over many lifetimes, I have done, I, I have done things with my body, speech, and mind that I really shouldn't have done, you know. And so it's it's addressing that. Yeah. Are you supposed to actually think about them? Yes. That's what I thought. Yeah. I mean, you're you're saying yeah. the words, but if you're doing it every day, you you should stop and think about. You know, yesterday I did X Y Z. I shouldn't have done that. I'll. Pay attention today not to do that. Yeah. Yeah, Peter. This may be a bit broad for the topic, but what's the distinction between being awake and being woke? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, you know what? I don't think I have an adequate response to that. I'd have to think about that for a while. I'd have to think about that for a while because there, there is a political dimension to that. And, and whereas I think when we're talking about an awakening, there is no political dimension. I think that's the biggest difference is being woke has a political dimension. Awakening does not. Any other questions or thoughts? Is that somebody? Shumon. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, if there are no other questions, Shimon was already ringing the bell to, was, was that you ringing the bell? Okay. okay, that's the first call. So I think we will allow the folks to begin to file out and I'll take over this evening. Shimon is doing the service in the hondo and I'll be doing the service with you. Uh, Ichishima Sensei, I, I should have asked you before we before we leave. I meant to, and then my mind was taken someplace else. Did you have any comments you wanted to make about Sheila or about Ohigan? 
Uh, well, the, in Japan, uh, Ohigan is, uh, you know, uh, most many people visit uh, their tombs so that uh, their wishes uh, maybe extend straight to the uh, western part of the land of paradise. Uh, uh, Japanese people sort of Saiho Gokuraku Jodo, so western uh, very far beyond here. Uh, most many of the, our ancestors will uh, live together with Buddha. So if we uh, pray for uh, such, you know, the day for the ancestors, they, their mind straightly leads to the uh, other shore. Well, spring equinox day or autumnal equinox day is a, uh, night and daytime even. So uh, Japanese people thought, you know, the equinox day, uh, sun rises exactly from the east and set exactly to the west. So uh, the mind of, of the prayer of the visitors to, to their tombs straight uh, extend to their wishes to the uh, land of paradise where uh, their ancestors are supposed to be. So most of the people uh, visit their tombs on the days during one week. The, the cent uh, central day of the uh, spring equinox day is the 21st of March. And then uh, today is the end of the Ohigan. So during the one week, centering 21st. Okay? So 21st of March, it's a national holiday in Japan. Uh, <clears throat> so many people naturally go to their tombs. Like a uh, open season, they return to their home uh, to, <clears throat> what shall I say, familiar with their ancestors. That, that seems, I think. And Shira concern, maybe this is uh, morality. Uh, you see, sincerely, we Usually we forget uh, our ancestors, but uh, um, Sira to pre to to keep such a respect that is uh, a meaning of Sira in that case. I think that is my comment. In a sense of gratitude, I think. Yes. Remember one's ancestors with a sense of gratitude. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I'll be with you in just a moment. Some of the folks here are gonna file out. Sheila, one of the six perfections that we examined during Ohigan was subject to the discussion this evening. I hope it was both meaningful and interesting to you. The Bodhisattva path can be viewed as pure altruism. And at the level of the person who is an advanced bodhisattva, this is true. But when we examine the six perfections, we start with the easiest to understand and act upon, dana, generosity. Then we move on to shila, which is morality, ethics. And that requires more attention. Ashante, which is next, is patience and tolerance. And again, it requires a little bit more attention. It's a little bit more difficult. Virya, effort and courage now get to the very difficult aspect. And then dhyana, and it's, which is samadhi. And it's interesting because we've all been doing meditation this evening. We think, hey, that's not so hard. Why is dhyana harder than, let's say, virya? And we have to recognize that there's a difference in how we do samadhi. Anyone can do samadhi. There's no right or wrong. Well, I, I shouldn't say there's no right and wrong way. There's not a very definitive right and wrong way to do meditation. However, to reach deep samadhi requires a lot more than just sitting quietly. It requires working on one's uh, ethics. It requires study. 
uh, Jiggy makes a very big distinction between the balance between study and meditation. Uh, if one doesn't study, then really we don't have much to work with in relation to meditation. And then finally, of course, is prajna or wisdom. That's the most difficult. Um, finally, when we are starting on the Buddhist path, we do it to improve ourselves, not to add this to the suffering of others. Then we do it to those for those that we love, followed by those whom we know, then to those we don't know, and finally, to those whom we might disagree. By the time we get to those we don't know, we're in the altruistic realm. It's much easier to do something for people that we care for, people that we know, than it is for people that we, that we don't know or we don't really care for. A Buddhist practice is more than meditation or chanting. It's embedded in the six perfections. And taking these six practices may lead to awake, may lead to awakening if you practice them diligently. They will definitely make you a better human being. And in so doing, you will relieve the suffering of others. So the question that I have for you right now is what's stopping you? <laughs> if you're not already practicing, now is the time to begin to practice the six perfections on the cushion while walking, while both walking and seated, and finally, in everyday life. Ohigan is the time when the provisional and the mundane worlds are in, that is to say, the absolute and sacred, are in closest approximation. This is the time to realize samsara and nirvana reside within you simultaneously. Now is the time to be truly transformed and to assist others in their transformation. Buddhist equanimity, upeksha, is not a thought nor an emotion. It is a steady, conscious recognition that the provisional reality is transient. And during this ohigan, period is the time that we make that observation in which we can rededicate ourselves. Svaha. Thank you, Monty. And let me. I saw this quote by Jimmy Carter, and it seemed to fit this evening's discussion. We must adjust to changing times and still hold on to unchanging principles.